is Thursday, November 19th. We're here with Harry Rice, the sound archivist at Berea College, and he will be interviewed by Timmy Reedy and Tammy Clements. And it's okay. 2009. Oh, and that is the year, which is important. Okay, so thank you very much, Harry, for agreeing to talk to us this morning. We're um, excited about the fellowship and about the resources that you have to offer. So first, we would like to um, just get a little bit uh, of information about you, and we'd like to know where you're from. Well, um, I was born and I grew up in Ashland, Kentucky, up in Boyd County on the Ohio River. Uh, the West Virginia Ohio border area and um, uh, as I said grew up there went to uh, school and um, ended up on my uh, kind of my journey to Berea um, uh, ended up uh, for college down at Barberville Kentucky I went to Union College and uh, um, Th there I majored in, in sociology, um, sociology and history, with no idea that I'd ever work in, in an archives uh, like this. Uh, and uh, that college work uh, set me off on 20-some, uh, uh, 20, 20, almost 30 years of work in, uh, for the state of Kentucky in uh, public welfare and uh, uh, public health. And um, much of that time, um, uh, much of that work required a, a, a good bit of travel uh, in the southeastern part of the, of the state. Uh, I ended up living in uh, Barberville and Corbin and Manchester uh, uh, at various times uh, over those years. Um, I suppose the most of that time was uh, in, in Corbin. Kentucky. Did I say Corbin otherwise? Mm -hmm. Barberville, Corbin, 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 and Manchester. Manchester. Yeah. And um, so in about 1994, I um, uh, uh, decided that uh, uh, I would uh, look for some other kinds of work to do and uh, decided to go back to library school. I got my master's degree at the University of Kentucky in library and information, I guess it's library and information science that they're calling it that at this at that time. And uh, with the idea that I, I did wanted to do archival kinds of work rather than more traditional uh, library work. And so I took courses and did practicum uh, at UK uh, relating to uh, to archives. One of my uh, uh, practicum projects uh, was um, inventorying the uh, John Lair collection down in Renfro Valley. Um, now that was uh, some time before all of that material moved here to, to the Berea College archives. And so that was one of my uh, uh, very uh, kind of formative uh, experiences in, in, uh, in archival work. It was uh, hugely fascinating and um, uh, learned uh, a whole lot, uh, both about Renfro Valley and about John Renfro Valley and John Lair and his the world that he lived in, the the country music and folk music world that he uh, grew up in and uh, uh, promoted in his uh, radio and other work down there. So anyway, I came, I finished finished my my degree and uh, got here. Uh, that was about 1996, and I started um, uh, volunteering here at the library uh, in special collections. And um, uh, finally, uh, gradually worked into getting paid uh, for, for the work. Um, first on a, on a part-time basis, half-time basis, and then um, uh, uh, rotated back and forth between full-time and part-time uh, uh, in, uh, in helping out with sabbatical replacement work uh, for full-time staff. 
And so for several years now, I can't remember how long it's been, I've been uh, working full time as the sound archivist. Wow. Mm. That's fascinating. That's mm -hmm. a lot of information. Um, so what kind of music did you grow up listening to? Well, for the, for the, uh, the kinds of things that I was interested in, <coughs> The, my very my very first uh, memory of music that I heard on the radio um, was um, somehow that it always sticks in my mind. Turn your radio on. That you know, and in my I grew up in in town, and my my family weren't particularly uh, oriented to uh, country music. Uh, and it is, as, a, as, as in terms of the neighborhood, I was very much a, uh, a city kid. Uh, you know, Ashland was much more city than lots of other places uh, I might have lived in, that I've lived in, 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 in later. But uh, anyway, uh, I remember that, and, and uh, in high school, I was listening to Elvis. Uh, for instance, but I also was listening to big bands, uh, Glenn Miller and, and yeah. Tommy Dorsey, and I don't know why that is exactly. It wasn't cool, uh, you know. Uh, in my in, at my age in high school, uh, big bands weren't what the rest of the kids were listening to. Uh, I'm not sure how that came about, uh, but you know, I was like I said, I was listening to Elvis and in the, the various other pop tunes of the day. Um, uh, anyway, I don't know. Yeah, I love so, the music too. Yeah. yeah. So, and then also I, I started paying, getting, um, uh, hearing and, and not, not exact, trying to figure out what I was hearing in the way of, of bluegrass music. Um, banjo tunes, banjo music that, you know, now I knew, I know was bluegrass, were, uh, came to my attention here and there, and I realized that, again, at then, I was listening to Bill Monroe, um, for instance, and uh, Flat, Lester Flatt and Earl Scruggs, and um, so it just gradually got my attention, so I guess I was, again, Oh, I don't know if I was still at home, not very far, but that was probably after after college. I was uh, it was when Flat and Scrubs were were on television. Uh, you were seeing that may have been during late high school years too. Anyway, I was seeing actually seeing bluegrass musicians. And I guess Flat and Scrubs were. Were my bit more, were the images that stick in my mind as my, the earliest bluegrass? I never saw Bill Monroe um, until way, way, way much later in my life. And, uh, Did traveling around all those <coughs> years in southeastern Kentucky was probably listening to the radio in your car. Did that affect you at all, or toward bluegrass music? Well, um, I, I, I didn't, it was a long time before bluegrass was a, a word that I, you know, came came. Uh, to easily into my mind, uh, and uh, so I was listening. A lot of the music that I was, most of the music I was listening to was was recorded, and um, uh, I guess another another group that got my attention uh, pretty early was the Weavers. Um, you all know who I'm talking about, Pete Seeger and and three or four other folks. Mm -hmm. Um, I was certainly in the college, my college years, and I was listening to uh, uh, in the later in the '60s uh, uh, radio program I could pick up at home. Uh, after this was after college, I was you know the folk revival I guess was going on, and so I could pick up WBZ in Boston uh, on Sunday. Seems like it was Sunday night or Saturday, Sunday night I think, and they were doing lots of of uh, folk music uh, of the day, you know, not so not necessarily bluegrass, but the the folk revivalists of the day, and uh, 
and I can, uh, I hadn't thought about this in a long time. I, this was in, in high school years, I was early in the morning, you'd hear Flatt and Scruggs on WSM uh, weekdays, and you could pick up, maybe, you know, you could pick up the 50,000 watt stations in, uh, in uh, well, e much easier than you can today. And you can always pick those, those stations up real early in the morning uh, in, in cold weather. <laughs> a lot easier. And so I was listening to Flat and Scruggs on, on the radio and they were, uh, I don't know if you know the, their, their repertoire, but uh, you know, they did lots of, lots of the, the tunes, obviously, that they were known for as a band, but uh, uh, in terms of, of the old, old time music tradition, uh, probably every show they would have uh, um, uh, Earl Scruggs and Paul Warren, the fiddler, do just just a banjo fiddle tune uh, arrangement that was not strictly uh, bluegrass. And so I was getting, my ears were getting attuned to that kind of thing. So uh, anyway, I, I, I am not a musician, don't play instrument, don't play anything. And uh, so, so certainly a, a record collector early on. And uh, so I don't know. Uh, what else to say? Ask questions. Okay. Um, well, in terms of your work in the archive, um, you said a little bit about the collection that you worked on that actually preceded it coming to right. Korea. Um, but what other kinds of what what does your work entail? Um, Exactly. I mean, I assume that it, it includes maybe some some processing and organizing, but but you do a lot of different things. So if you could say a little bit about the, the range of work that you do. Well, uh, uh, <coughs> my job w with the Hutchins Library here at Berea College is sound archivist. That's the, the job title, but uh, that's not in terms of, of everyday kinds of things. Uh, Various of us here in the library, in the special collections department, take turns being the reference librarian or the reference archivist for anybody that comes in, uh, and it uh, frequently is is not related. Sometimes it is related to audio material that I know something about, but oftentimes uh, it's all sorts of other things. So I'm kind of a, all of us here, uh, and I certainly am a kind of a jack of all trades. Uh, as far as, as handling reference requests from students and faculty and staff. And so, um, but uh, I, I, I know probably the most about audio material that's in the, in the archives, and not just music. Uh, the archives contain, um, uh, when, I, when I came to work for the library here, um, besides all of the Appalachian and regional music collections that had come in here from the Appalachian Center, um, there were large numbers of audio recordings of college events and oral history <coughs> and uh, commencements and uh, commencements and various anyway various events, chapel programs or commencement. I mean. Uh, now we call it, call it convocation programs. So um, when I came, it was part of, of, of my work was bringing together as far as databases and cataloging all of that material. And um, uh, so mm, the kinds of things that that you that we're always concerned about in an archives that the the the. the uh, Philosophically, uh, uh, perhaps, saying is 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 this tension between providing access and and and, and uh, preserving the material, and um, so with, when it comes to audio, uh, historically uh, we had lots of audio on on very old formats like reel to reel tape, and so part of my work. Uh, uh, for a long time was transferring the reel-to-reel -reel tape to audio cassettes for people to listen to. Mm -hmm. And um, so in that process you get to know, you, you look, at, look at the label on the box, but then in the process of, of transferring it, uh, you get to hear stuff and you get to know it better. 
And um, so th those, those two things from the audio and, and media general uh, uh, perspective is what I'm concerned with is, is, is preservation and, and access. And um, so part of the part of the access is is providing catalog records, just very you know traditional uh, library catalog records for collections of recordings and collections of either music recordings or uh, oral history recordings. And um, um, we have been real fortunate uh, in terms of funding. Uh, through various sources. Uh, the um, uh, Appalachian College Association uh, has a program uh, called the Digital Library of Appalachia, which uh, has provided us access, online access, to uh, audio, making audio material, especially traditional music, available uh, very broadly. And uh, we've also had some, some uh, um, uh, Funding made available for hiring a, a full-time person to do uh, digitization of audio materials, uh, which is sort of the next step beyond using audio cassettes to make things available uh, with the uh, oncoming uh, possibilities through digitization. Um, we've enhanced our, our um, um, preservation uh, activities uh, greatly. Uh, now, instead of lots and lots of uh, a pile of CDs uh, to preserve the audio files, uh, we have a server uh, and uh, uh, that provides some both security and, and um, uh, long-term preservation possibilities. Um, and um, so um, those are the kinds of things day to day that that I'm uh, doing. Right. Sounds great. So, could you give us a little um, background on the fellowship? And well, the fellowship that we're we're talking about uh, another uh, grant uh, opportunity that we uh, had uh, going on five years ago now um, uh, to from uh, a uh, from what is called the Anne Ray Charitable Trust, and um, uh, that that uh, source of financing, uh, uh, that entity was very in, is very interested in in the support of various uh, aspects of of uh, very roughly the arts uh, culture. Um, uh, preservation of, of, of uh, uh, various culture, uh, as, uh, I'm not doing a good job, uh, uh, the arts in various ways, uh, folk arts partic among other things. Um, and so one of the things that we proposed uh, along with several other programs here on campus was a, a fellowship program that would support researchers coming to the library to, to make use of the audio uh, and video, but mainly audio traditional music collections. So um, it, the, the project uh, became the Appalachian um, Music Fellowship Program. And um, it uh, uh, provides, it continues to provide uh, a stipend to to uh, uh, researchers of various uh, interests uh, to come and uh, uh, make use of, of the audio material. Uh, the um, the archives webpage uh, illustrates real vividly the huge variety of folks that have. Uh, found uh, what they were looking for. Uh, we've had uh, at least three three uh, fiddle scholars uh, of various with various interests. Um, one from uh, British Columbia in Canada. Uh, a couple of others from 
the United States. Uh, we've had uh, a, uh, uh, a uh, Irish uh, button accordion player uh, from Ireland who was, uh, we've had artists in the schools, kinds of folks who were uh, developing uh, curriculum uh, uh, for, for music, obviously for music, music in the schools, uh, but some had one, uh, one uh, artist in the school person who was certainly looking at songs to use, but another one who was looking at dance uh, tunes to use. And um, I've had um, so there's there's the aspect uh, we the, the 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 folks who have made use of the of our collections some are strictly the traditional academic perspectives they're PhD or master's degree candidates who are working on their thesis or their, their dissertations um, others are uh, more. Uh, out in the real world kinds of people, as I said, like artists in the schools, teachers, um, performers. Um, so um, the, the fellowship program uh, starting last, uh, this past July, sort of changed its, uh, its widened its, its focus. And now it's called the Appalachian Sound Archives Fellowship Program to um, indicate that we're inviting folks to look at our regional audio related materials um, in addition to music and uh, we're uh, making it possible for folks to look at the spoken word um, that are you know, oftentimes related uh, to, uh, to music but spoken word in the form of folklore uh, we have uh, major, major uh, audio collection of uh, Kentucky uh, folklore here um, by a man, a man by the name of Leonard Roberts who uh, was particularly noted, notable for his uh, work in the 19, late 1940s and into the 50s and 60s uh, of uh, folk tales, uh, magic tales, uh, um, jack tales, um, and in the process he recorded lots of, of young people, uh, which was kind of unusual. Uh, sound recordings uh, was, were fairly unusual at the time when he started in 49, and um, recording uh, what, what children were, 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 were saying or remembering or what, what they knew about stories and tales was fairly unusual at the time. So uh, that collection, uh, and he included music as well. But uh, So anyway, uh, we broadened that focus to spoken word, uh, religion, uh, religious expression. Uh, we have lots of material in the archives by uh, a couple of scholars that uh, especially uh, focused on the old regular Baptist uh, singing and preaching traditions, which uh, were very, uh, are, R O A A U R A O, however you say, spell that, uh, oriented the, the old regular Baptist singing traditions were passed on from ear to ear uh, rather than, than, than notes written down on a page. And um, uh, another area related to the region, uh, both music and spoken word, that we're strong in is radio programs, uh, uh, again from uh, 30s, 40s. 50s um, that uh, turn out to have a number of interesting pieces, uh, uh, things we didn't quite realize we had in terms of uh, 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 a jug band, for instance, that played on a Kentucky Derby, uh, <laughs> a, a pre-Kentucky Derby uh, sports broadcast. Uh, that we didn't know about, and uh, some African American uh, uh, singers uh, on the radio in in the uh, late forties in Louisville uh, that we didn't know about, and, uh, and until we started 
getting into it. So, um, the, um, uh, I, I suppose the, another way to talk about the fellowships in terms of who's been uh, attracted, we've got, we've had, we haven't had, we've had applications from several other countries, England, uh, and as, as I said, uh, Canada and, and Ireland, and um, um, so it's it's uh, through the web, of course, it's it's fairly widely known, and uh, uh, we continue to have a lot of interest, uh, again from a, from a variety of, of uh, uh, kinds of scholars and other folks. You mentioned oral histories, and that's something that we're not as familiar with in terms of the collections here, <coughs> and I mm -hmm. just wonder if you could say a little bit about the oral histories that are in the sound archives and where they come from and whether they are related um, directly to sound archives going out and getting them or if there's students bringing them. I'm just curious about the, the yeah. range of of materials in right. oral history specifically? Mm -hmm. Well, the oral history uh, collections that we have come from, a, as you might imagine, come from a wide variety of sources. Um, the, uh, the, field the music field recordings that we have include a lot of oral history because those researchers um, uh, not only want to hear the, uh, the musician sing or play their fiddle or whatever, but they also uh, want to know where they learned the tunes, who they learned them from, what their life experience was, uh, you know, those kinds of things. Uh, but then there are, certainly are more uh, uh, concentrated uh, kinds of, of oral history efforts that focus on one particular subject. Uh, two or three, at two or three different times, uh, the college has uh, mounted oral history recording projects uh, to uh, capture uh, the memories of, of uh, faculty and staff uh, who, uh, you know, we, some of the folks that were recorded in 1970, 1980 were folks who came here in the 30s, mm -hmm. you know, so they, they were, uh, there's that kind of oral history. A lot of those, the college oral history uh, program, uh, project have also have typed transcripts. Mm -hmm. um, there have been uh, um, individual oral history uh, interviews done uh, by a variety of folks for a variety of reasons. Uh, a lot we do, we we are in the last couple of years, particularly, we've been able to um, both. Trans both preserve those recordings uh, digitally, but also with student uh, help uh, transcribe those recordings. Uh, and they cover a wide variety of, of subject areas. Um, one particular scholar here at the college, Loyal Jones, uh, who founded the Appalachian Center, did a, a, a huge amount of recording folks occasionally over time. Uh, he is certainly one source of oral history recordings of folks related to, who are notable for their, either their music or for other uh, uh, things that, that they are notable for as in, in, in the region as scholars, as educators, as uh, I suppose even poets and activists. So uh, those recordings and several others, uh, we have oral history uh, projects that uh, um, I'm going back and forth between the, the region and the college. Um, we have some some very good oral history on on the men and women's basketball program here. Uh, the history of the women's basketball program, for instance, is is very interesting. Um, in that, uh, I'm going to forget my year at this point, but up to a, up to a point, there was no varsity women's basketball. There was only intramural basketball. So, our, our recently done and now readily available women's oral history, uh, women's basketball oral history, uh, covers that 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 transition uh, from uh, from intramurals to full. Um, Title Mound came in yeah. in the mid-70s, and this was the very best place for women to come and play basketball because they went 
according to the old women's standards. So if you played basketball here and you it didn't matter, I don't mean to come in, but if you won or lost, um, you got together afterward at both teams and it was more about fellowship and anyway. So that that comes out in those in those interviews. Yeah, that's and right. um, so the thing about oral history, the fascinating thing about oral history for me is, um, in general, is that that it brings to the present uh, in a way that that a typed page cannot. Uh, you get facts and figures and dates and so forth on a on a typed transcript, but you there's no way that you can. Uh, capture the sound of a person's voice, or any any of those those relatively intangible things that are they're only communicated visually, orally. Uh, 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 the tone of voice, the, the the way somebody pronounces words, uh, accents, uh, emotions that are expressed only in in. Uh, in uh, vocally, and uh, so that's what what um, uh, is, I found particularly interesting uh, and attractive about uh, well audio generally, but especially spoken word audio, oral histories, and radio programs, and uh, uh, bringing, as I said, bringing to the present folks that are no longer with us. And you have conducted oral histories yourself? Yeah, uh, I've I've done various various things. Uh, I've done several several uh, interviews with folks related to Renfro Valley uh, who had not been recorded before, and uh, uh, I did an oral history project. Um, that uh, related to an organization whose papers we have here, the Council of the Southern Mountains, um, back a few years back. And um, um, those are the, the, the two, two areas that I've worked a whole lot in. And um, so uh, what else? That's great. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm. well, uh, um, that's all of our questions. Yeah. Um, well, <coughs> I guess before we end, if we could talk just a little bit about the project that we're working on and maybe some okay. impressions of, of that. I mean, you've offered a lot of really great contextual information for us about, um, you know, the area of Harlan County where um, the Reedy family originated from, as well as some of the areas that they, they've gone to. And we certainly have room to do a more extensive conversation on that specifically, but it would be helpful to just um, have, have some impressions of either their music in general or um, how you see them within the wider context mm -hmm. of yeah. Of bluegrass music, or the Appalachian region, or uh, Appalachian migration, or <laughs> I don't, that. like I said, like I said, we can definitely have a much more extensive that conversation. Yeah. But the thing that that um, that uh, uh, I thought was real interesting, that I found real interesting about <coughs> your project, and, and it, it reminded me of of uh, of this uh, especially, was the fact that. Um, um, Historically, over time, the the uh, collectors, the folk music collectors, the early folk music collectors, uh, didn't pay us. Didn't for whatever reason. Uh, it probably was more by chance, you know, as where, where roads went and so forth. Uh, people like Alan Lomax, um, who documented all sorts of, of, of traditional music, both in Kentucky and other places in the country. Uh, didn't, those folks, as far as, as audio recordings, didn't get a lot in Harlan County. Um, in the Library of Congress uh, database for Harlan County, uh, there's very relatively uh, few recordings. There's only one 
and I'm s the name has completely left me right now, a fiddler uh, from Harlan County. Ah, can't remember at the point. But very little was paid to attention, uh, and you can say that about several other places uh, in, in the state. There was a lot more attention was paid to, to Perry County and, and uh, uh, Leslie County and uh, uh, perhaps Clay County, uh, just as far as, as what got recorded. Uh, that doesn't mean the folks didn't, the, the, the collectors didn't pass through, but uh, uh, just audio-wise. Uh, so, um, a few, uh, 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 and you can say the same thing, you're, you're the, the, the John and Francis lived in Whitley County for a, a long time, and Corbin as well, and the same thing happened there. Um, the the early collectors didn't didn't light in uh, in Whitley County at all. Uh, they came they were in Bell County, <laughs> but they didn't make it to to Whitley. And but my point is that that folks uh, uh, oftentimes uh, maybe not not knowingly set off to document themselves. Uh, you had a group in, in Harlan County called the Jones Creek Quartet uh, who were made up totally of, of coal miners and uh, they unfortunately only recorded four sides uh, of their, uh, but they, they went someplace in, 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 in the late, early, early 50s I think and, and got two 78 RPM discs recorded of themselves that we ended up getting copies of here. And it just reminded me, you know, it was wonderful uh, music uh, in the, in the uh, very, very, or you would call it very, very early bluegrass. It was a quartet, I mean, they were singing, they were, they were using a, a guitar and a mandolin, uh, which was a little bit unusual uh, in terms of other folks. You usually had mandolin and, and guitar duets, but I'm going off on. <laughs> On tangents, but the, 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 as I said, the, the, the point at which, uh, that that the, the Reedy family material that you all are working on is that they did, uh, uh, in part, they were documenting themselves when nobody else was, uh, and probably in kind of in a pretty uh, unselfconscious way, they they were recording, they were working on the radio, uh, and that was another way uh, that folks. Uh, documented to themselves to a certain extent, uh, at least in 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 a limited amount of time. Sometimes, a lot, many times, those radio programs didn't get recorded, but uh, they were communicating uh, that way. They were expressing th themselves that way and uh, uh, spreading music around and sharing it. And uh, folks were were telling them what they liked to hear and they were telling other folks this is what we like to play and there was that kind of, of um, interchange uh, that was possible especially on the radio uh, 40s, 30s, 40s, I'm pretty sure they were working more in the 40s and 50s mm -hmm. and uh, so it's a wonderful story uh, and there, it's not the only one, the, those folks weren't the only, your, your grandparents weren't the only ones uh, who were involved in that, but uh, we know more about them uh, than we know about some folks with the work that you all are doing. And, um, and another real important part of, of their story is, is uh, their uh, interaction as they move from, from Kentucky to the Dayton area. Um, they're they're fitting into becoming part of this this community of, of folks who who migrated from Kentucky and other places south to work in Ohio and of course on to Michigan and, and other other places uh, that the community of, of Appal the Appalachian communities in Cincinnati and Dayton particularly um, had. You know, those those out of those communities came lots of, of uh, uh, what we now call bluegrass musicians. Um, uh, some who continued to be you know who, who got made fairly good names for themselves, but a whole big community of, of music up there that that uh, 
uh, both was, you know, it was back music from back home, but it also became music, you know, Dayton and Cincinnati became home, and so you, you had music that uh, I hope you'll, you'll find out more about how the, the various uh, uh, musical streams came together. I'm sure there were lots of opportunities if it, if, if, if it wasn't if it wasn't possible in, in, in Kentucky, uh, when folks moved to Dayton and Cincinnati, they uh, started interacting with African American musicians, for instance. Uh, and African American musicians started, who may not have known before, uh, so we're, we're hearing music from Kentucky. Uh, how that happens is, you know, it's very, con very, it happened in many, many ways, and how it happened with with John and Francis is, is the ongoing uh, 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 thing that we're, we're hoping to find out more about. So. Thank you very much, Harry. That was great. Yes, thank you All so right. much for your time. And yeah. I think you covered a lot of information very well. And we didn't even have to ask any questions. Did <laughs> you answer it? <laughs> it's dangerous. Oh, did you take a look at that? <laughs> no. It's dangerous. You need to be sure you have all the questions. <laughs> don't let me don't let me hijack your interview. <laughs> it was great. Actually, in what we're learning, it's like, you know, just do what we just did, and that a lot of the questions that you have written down will be answered. You know, in just ways of conversation. So that was excellent. Right. So you're you're a good interviewee. You're great. It means that you that was it. great. <laughs>